But it's interesting to be able to cover this. There's nothing in the world like being able to cross a green line whenever you want and speak to both sides of a conflict. I can't tell you how horrible and wonderful it is at the same time. In the West Bank and Gaza and Israel, there are very few people in this world who can march right across guarded checkpoints, closed military zones, and talk to Palestinians in the same day that they were almost embedded with Israeli troops. And that's something that we get to do on a regular basis. And I just wish that the leadership of all these different entities, ours included, could do the same thing because they would have an eye-opening experience, horrible and wonderful, all at the same time. And it would give a lot of insight as to how messages are heard and how you can negotiate. Because you cannot negotiate when someone can't hear you or refuses to hear you or can't even understand your language. And that's clearly what's happening in a lot of places in the world right now, the West Bank, Gaza, and Israel, not the least of which. There's very little listening and understanding going on. Our language is entirely different than theirs. And I don't just mean the words. When you hear the word Hezbollah, you probably think evil, danger, terror, right away. If I could just see a show of hands, who thinks that Hezbollah is a bad word? Show of hands. Usually connotes fear, terror, some kind of suicide bombing. If you live in the Arab world, Hezbollah means Shriner. Hezbollah means charity. Hezbollah means hospitals. Hezbollah means welfare and jobs. These are not the same organizations we're dealing with. How can you negotiate when you're talking about two entirely different meanings? And until we understand, we don't have to like Hezbollah. We don't have to like their militancy. We don't have to like what they do on the side. But we have to understand that they like it, that they like the good things about Hezbollah, and that you can't just paint it with a blanket statement that it's a terrorist organization. Because even when it comes to the militancy, these people believe that militancy is simply freedom fighting and resistance. You can't argue with that. You can try to negotiate, but you can't say it's wrong flat out. And that's some of the problems we have in dealing with this war on terror. As a journalist, I'm often ostracized just for saying these messages, just for going on television and saying, here's what the leaders of Hezbollah are telling me, and here's what the Lebanese are telling me, and here's what the Syrians have said about Hezbollah. Here's what they have to say about the Golan Heights. Like it or lump it, don't shoot the messenger. But invariably, the messenger gets shot. We hired somebody uh, on MSNBC recently named Michael Savage. Some of you may know, may know his name already from his radio program. He was so taken aback by my dare to speak with Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade about why they do what they do, why they're prepared to sacrifice themselves for what they call a freedom fight and we call terrorism. He was so taken aback that he chose to, to label me as a slut on the air. And that's not all. As a porn star. And that's not all. As an accomplice to the murder of Jewish children. So these are the ramifications for simply being the messenger in the Arab world. How can you discuss, how can you solve anything when ad hominem attacks from a mere radio flag is what America hears on a regular basis, let alone at the government level? I mean, if this kind of attitude is prevailing, forget discussion, forget diplomacy. Diplomacy is becoming a bad word. I, I'm, I'm fascinated to find out how we are going to diplomatically fix what's broken now in Iraq. Because nobody thinks Jay Garner is going to be a leader for Iraq. They don't want him to be a leader. He says he doesn't want to be a leader, but he sure as heck wants to put a leader in there that is akin with our interests here in America so that we don't have to face this trouble again. Clearly, it's the same kind of idea we had in Afghanistan with Hamid Karzai. You know, they all look at him as a puppet. We look at him as a success story. Again, two different languages being spoken and not enough coverage of that side. Again, I'm not saying support for that side. There are a lot of things I hate about that side. But there's got to be the coverage. There's got to be the journalism. And sometimes that is really missing in our effort to make good TV and good cable news. When I said the war was over, <clears throat> I kind of mean that in the sense that cards are being pulled from this famous deck now of, of the 55 most wanted. 
and they're sort of falling out of the deck as quickly as the numbers are falling off the ratings chart for the cable news stations. We have plummeted into the basement in the last week. We went from millions of viewers to just a few hundred thousand in the course of a couple of days. Did our broadcasting change? Did we get boring? Did we all of a sudden lose our flair? Did we start using language that people didn't want to hear? No. I think you've just had enough. I think you've seen the story. You've seen how it ended. It ended pretty well in most Americans' view. It's time to move on. What's the next big story? Is it Lacey Peterson? Because Lacey Peterson got a whole lot more minutes worth of coverage on the uh, cable news channels in the last week than we'd have ever expected just a few days after a regime fell, like Saddam Hussein. I don't want to suggest for a minute that, that we are shallow people, we Americans. <clears throat> At times we are. But I do think that the phenomenon of our attention deficit disorder when it comes to watching television news and watching stories and then just being finished with them, I think it might come from the saturation that you have nowadays. You cannot walk by an airport monitor. You can't walk by most televisions in offices these days in the public without it being on a cable news channel. And if you're not in front of a TV, you're probably in front of your monitor where there is internet news available as well. You have had more minutes of news on the Iraq war in just the three-week campaign than you likely ever got in the years and years of network news coverage of Vietnam. You were forced to wait for it till 6 o'clock every night, and the likelihood that you got more than about eight minutes of coverage in that half-hour show, you probably didn't get a whole lot more than that. And it was about two weeks old, some of that footage, having been shipped back. Now it's real time and it is blanketed to the extent that we could see this one arm of the advance, but not where the bullets landed. But I think the saturation point is reached faster because you just get so much, so fast, so absolutely in real time that it is time to move on. And that makes our job very difficult because we tend to leave behind these vacuums that are left uncovered. When was the last time you saw a story about Afghanistan? It's only been a year, you know? Only since the, the major combat ended. We were still in Operation Anaconda, I think not much more than about 11 or 12 months ago. And, and here we are not touching Afghanistan at all on cable news. There was just a memorandum that came through saying we're closing the Kabul Bureau. Well, the Kabul Bureau has only been staffed by one person for the last several months. Maria Fazel, she's Afghan, she wanted to be there. Otherwise, I don't think anyone would have taken that assignment. There's just been no allotment of TV minutes for Afghanistan. And I'm very concerned that the same thing is about to happen with Iraq. Because we're going to have another Gary Condit, and we're going to have another Chandra Levy, and we're going to have another John Benet, and we're going to have another Elizabeth Smart. And here we are in Lacey Peterson. And these stories will dominate. They're easy to cover. They're cheap. They're fast. You don't have to send somebody overseas. You don't have to put them up in a hotel that's expensive overseas. And you don't have to set up satellite time overseas. Very cheap to cover domestic news. And domestic news is music to news directors' ears. But is that, is that what you need to know? Don't you need to know what our personality is overseas and what the ramifications of these campaigns are? Because we went to Iraq according to the president, to make sure that we were going to be safe from weapons of mass destruction, that no one would attack us. Well, did everything all of a sudden change? The terror alert went down. All of a sudden, everything seems to be better. But I can tell you from living over there, it's not. There are a lot of people who hate us. And it only takes one man who's crazy enough to strap a bunch of suicide devices onto his body to let us know that he can instill fear in even a place like Manhattan. You're not immune from it. One suicide bomb in a mall in a small town in America can paralyze this country because every small town will think it's vulnerable. Not just New York, not just D.C., not just L.A., everybody. And we may not be far from that. And, and I'm desperately depressed that it's come to this, that it's come to the American shores in the worst way. I was under the second tower when it came down in New York City on September 11th, so I have a real stake in this, and I've got two friends whose remains haven't been found yet. 
at the Trade Center, and that, uh, that, that stays with you for quite a while. It's important that we continue to want to know what happens overseas when we leave. It's important to demand coverage of these things. It's important because your safety and your future and your world and your children will depend on this stuff. If we had paid more attention to Afghanistan in the 80s, we might, might not have had 9-11. If we hadn't left it in such a mess, we might not have had 9-11. 3,000 people would be alive to talk to you today. If we do the same thing in Iraq, it is possible that without you even knowing, a brand new federation is formed where deals are made in secret because the leadership is not allowed to talk about America in good ways the street would blow up, because that's essentially what happens everywhere else in the Arab world right now. You can't talk about making deals and allowing the Americans to use your military bases, or you will be out like the Shah. Not in the election, of course, but you'd be out like the Shah. And most of these people worry about that. I'm very concerned that Iraq may end up the same way. There was a, a report in the New York Times a couple of days ago that sent everyone into a tizzy at the Pentagon. It was a report on the ground uh, in, Af in uh, Iraq that the Americans were going to have four bases that they would continue to use, possibly on a permanent basis, inside Iraq. Kind of in a star formation. The north, the south, Baghdad, and out west. Nobody was able to actually say what these bases would be used for, whether it was forward operations, whether it was simple access. But it did speak volumes to the Arab world who said, you see, we told you the Americans were coming for their imperialistic needs. They needed a foothold. They needed to control something in Central and West Asia to make sure that we all next door come into line. And these reports about Syria, well, they may have been breezed over fairly quickly here, but they are ringing loud still over there. Syria's next. And then Lebanon. And look out Iran. So whether we think it's plausible or whether the government even has any designs like that, the Arabs all think it's happening, and they think it's for religious purposes for the most part. Again, most of them are so uneducated, and they have such little access to media. What they do get is a very bad story, and there's no reason why they shouldn't be as afraid as they are. You know, they, they just don't have the luck that we do of open information. One of the things I wanted to mention about the technology of this war, because I know that we've got questions uh, that we want to get to. So I'll just tell you a little bit about some of the technology um, and how that's changed perhaps not only how the fighters behave, but how we see things. The tanks and the vehicles that are used in the front lines are so high tech that an artillery engineer can actually pinpoint a target that looks like a tiny stick man on a screen and simply destroy the target without ever seeing a warm body. Some of the soldiers, according to our embeds, had never seen a dead body throughout the entire three-week campaign. It was like Game Boy. I think that's amazing in two different ways. It makes you a far more successful warrior because you can just barrel right along, but it takes away a lot of what war is all about which is what I mentioned earlier. The TV technology took that away too. We couldn't see where the bullets landed. Nobody could see the horrors of this so that we seriously revisit the concept of warfare the next time we have to deal with it. I think there were a lot of dissenting voices before this war about the horrors of war, but I'm very concerned about this three-week TV show and how it may have changed people's opinions. It was very sanitized. It had a very brief respite from the sanitation when Terry Lloyd was killed, the ITN, and when David Bloom was killed, and when Michael Kelly was killed. We all sort of sat back for a moment and realized, God, this is ugly. This is hitting us at home now. This is hitting the non-combatants. But that went away quickly, too. 